Well, good morning, Rocky Peak. Hey, so good to be with you. My name's Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, before we go into our time of teaching, uh, just kind of one impromptu announcement um, came up uh, last service during worship. Just thought of something that I had this really cool conversation a couple weeks ago after the 11 o'clock. I was leaving, and I was kind of leaving late, and there was this, uh, three Hispanic ladies kind of coming out, and so we stopped, and they're fairly new to Rocky Peak, just loving it. And they were just, and they they were sharing these things I didn't know. They said that uh, they these three ladies have different ages, so. Uh, uh, kind of one was uh, not an English speaker at all. Others were uh, had different levels of uh, you know giftedness with with English as a second language. But it was so cool. They said that, that they use uh, Google Translate uh, during the message, and they said they can follow along perfectly everything. And it's just they said what a, it's just like God is just really meeting them here in a powerful way. And so I said, man, I got I got to let people know this, you know, because uh, you may, may you may, may be in that same boat where maybe uh, English is your second language, maybe you have someone you wanted to invite, uh, and you just felt like, well, we'd love to, but I'm not sure they could follow. Um, maybe it's it's not Spanish. Um, maybe it's a different, we have many people here that are coming from maybe um, Iran or from Jordan or something. Maybe there's, a, you know, I don't know all the languages covered by Google Translate, but I just wanted to mention that because that was a super cool thing, and it just opens the door. I was very excited about that. Uh, secondly, um, for those of you who are regulars here at Rocky Peak, you know that and typically, when I'll open, start my message, and I'll start with a story. And today, I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, yes, yes, I know. I know who stole our pastor. Right. Uh, it's a hologram. It's artificial intelligence uh, going, like, going crazy. Um, but I just want to let you know that because um, you see what just happened when I said that? Uh, I don't want that happening in the middle of the message, you know, because then I lose you for three minutes. Like, where did he go? Is he the, really the guy? Let me look. Uh, let me check. Different color watch band, maybe the wrong guy. Um, and so uh, anyway, so just want to let you know that we just got too much to cover today. I'll weave a little bit of that in as we go along, but there's just sometimes there's just too much to cover. So, hey, I'm excited to be here as we kind of wrap up this series together. Let's pray and go before the Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day that we can be with you. We thank you for your incredible vision for us that your followers, that if we know you, that we're in Christ. And, and as I was reading this morning, it's like every blessing, spiritual blessing in the heavenlies is ours in Christ. You love us like you love your son. And so, Lord, we're just excited to be pursuing you as a church in this series of hearing from you. And we pray today as we wrap it up, you just speak with uh, force and power according to our need. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So today, we are, uh, we're continuing kind of wrapping up this series that we've been in now. For this is our 10th week. It's called Hearing God Discerning His Voice. And for those of you who are brand new, a special welcome. Uh, the core concept of this series is very simple, that we believe that God is still speaking today to his people in a wide variety of ways. Um, and that's, uh, that if we, if we truly want to develop a personal relationship with God, uh, if we want to experience his life-changing presence and power in our lives, and if we want to carry out his vision, his calling in our lives, it's just vital. It's one of the most important uh, spiritual skills or life experiences we need to develop, we need to have in order to kind of walk well with God. And uh, so it's been an amazing journey. So, so, so for those of you who've been with us, you know that throughout this series, we've, we've talked about a wide variety of way that God speaks and how we can discern uh, when God is speaking and, and not the enemy or not ourselves. But one of the most important lessons we learned early on is that if we want to hear from God, that we need to become a certain kind of person. The kind of person that Jesus said is loving God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. The way I like to put it is we're pursuing God, that knowing, knowing God is our, our top priority. Uh, it's our, kind of our deepest passion uh, to, to know him, to love him, and to please him. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, last week actually, we kind of, we, we turned the corner, came down the home stretch of this series, and we began to talk about what does it look like to pursue God in such a way we become that kind of person? 
uh, that God can trust and speak to, and uh, how do we create space in our lives to do that? So if you were here last week, we did a deep dive on a, a beautiful passage of scripture in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul's writing to this younger pastor he's mentoring named Timothy, and what I wanna do today is just kind of uh, do a quick review, step back, where there's two key principles that came out of that passage as he shepherded t- Timothy. Here's what it looks like to pursue God and develop this kind of life-transforming relationship, and in our context, how to, uh, how to become a person that we can hear and respond to the voice of God. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Hearing God, Spiritual Training. You see the passage we looked at last week, but I wanna just quickly highlight these two principles to, to set the stage for where we're going today. And so you notice I've already filled in the blanks. We're not gonna spend a lot of time, but the first principle is that spiritual transformation is not automatic. And so what we talked about is that sometimes we assume that when we come to Jesus, we just grow automatically. But what we learned last week is that's not the case. And if we need, if we want to, if we want to grow and pursue God, we need to pursue Him with both intense, within both intentionality and intensity. And remember the example that Paul used as a model was an athlete who's training to compete in the games. So that was number one. The second principle was that uh, spiritual transformation requires a plan. So any athlete pursuing, who's preparing to compete, any athlete worth their salt is going to follow a specific uh, detailed training plan, how they work out, what they eat, their sleep, and so on. In the same way, if we want to pursue God, uh, in, in a speci- in, in, in a, like, like an athlete, we need a training plan. So last week I introduced this, con- this concept of, of a keystone habit. So I hope you remember that. Y'all, y'all remember that? So a keystone habit is a, a habit that is like a super habit that once established in our life tends to cause a, a series of habits to follow, almost like dominoes, like a chain reaction that actually lead to life transformation. And when we're talking about spiritual keystone habits, we highlighted three last week. Remember, we used the model of the three-legged stool of spiritual transformation, the model of spiritual transformation formation, the, the three legs of, of uh, large group gatherings like we do here in our weekends or encounters or whatever, uh, small group gatherings like our life groups or other similar small groups. Uh, and then the third keystone habit was this one-on-one time with God. And what I share with you is that what I've experienced is for most followers of Jesus, it's this third habit, this third keystone habit that is the hardest for us to develop, and yet that is the one that kind of works synergistically with the other two to unleash new power in our lives. And so last week we talked about why this keystone habit of uh, developing what I like to call a regular rhythm of relationship uh, and a regular uh, time with God throughout our week, whether it's daily or several times a week, uh, why it's so important. And what I share with you is that the longer I walk with Jesus and the more, the longer that I, I'm, I'm one of the leaders of his movement, service in that capacity, the more I convince that developing this habit is absolutely essential if we wanna grow, be transformed, if we want to become like Jesus, and we want to become that kind of person who can, God can trust, who can hear from him on a regular basis. So last week, we focused on the why this is so important, but I promised that this week we would come back and talk on the how. Like, how do you develop this keystone habit in your life? And so what I want to do today is kind of put on the hat of like a spiritual trainer, like a spiritual coach come alongside of you as if we were at Starbucks together and just saying, hey, let me share seven key steps. They're very simple, but not necessarily easy, but seven key steps to help you design a spiritual training plan in your life so that you can develop this keystone habit that can unlock this path of transformation uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So there in your note sheet, you have a section called Hearing God Designing Your Plan, right? So it's gonna be very simple, let's jump in. Number one, the first step is the step that we ended with last week, which is start with why. So if you were here last week, you remember that I ended the, 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 the message with this question, how big is your why? And that question has to do with motivation. Like if I were to ask you, hey, why do you want to develop this keystone habit in your life of spending time with God one-on-one, regular basis? Why do you want to do that? The question is like, how big is your why? How, how deep is that motivation? 
And what I share with you is that when it comes to making any significant change in our life, especially when it's uh, inter- something in the realm of time that's going to involve a change in schedule, that what I share with you, unless we have an adequate answer to the question of why, the cost is always too high. And can I tell you something that I've shared this over the years many, many times. And can I tell you, honestly, very few people pay attention to me. And the reason is because we all tend to think, especially after a series like this, I don't need to do that. I know the why. I want to get close with God. I want to hear his voice. I want to be transformed. And that may be serve as great motivation for about two weeks. But if your motivation, if you haven't really taken the time to think through the implications long term of why this is so important, chances are that it won't carry you over the long haul. So I want to encourage you to ask two questions when you're asking this question why. Um, and, and so I want to I give those questions, just talk real quickly about them. So the first question is, and I, I began to talk about this last week, but I want you to ask the question, what will my life be like? And then fill in there, five, 10, 15, 20 years, you put in the time. What will my life be like if I create this keystone habit in my life? And then this is really important, the second question, What will my life be like if I don't? And what I would encourage you is to really take this to the Holy Spirit in prayer and ask him to unleash your imagination, to help you. In fact, I feel so strongly about this that here's what I'd suggest. Let's say that this week you decide, this is the week I'm I'm gonna start to really pursue God and build this keystone habit. I would encourage you this first week, this is your top priority. Just spend the week. Because remember, our goal is not, not to st- just start well, but to finish well. And this is where it starts, all right? So, so in your time with God, just make this a matter of prayer. Make it a time of journaling. Ask him to unleash your imagination. Because I truly believe that this is life-changing, that your relationships, your finances, your career, your ministry, your family, your marriage, that that everything is gonna be impacted by this. And so once we begin to see that, we begin to say, okay, this becomes a non-negotiable, all right? Number two, the second step is to recruit your trainer. Now, you could look at this question, you could think in terms of, hey, uh, this could be a spiritual, uh, like a spiritual um, a director, it could be, um, it could be like a, someone who's mentoring you spiritually, or it could be someone like an accountability partner, you're doing this together, but that's not my primary meaning of this. Those are all good. But when I talk about recruit your trainer, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. One of the things we've learned in this series is that when we come to Jesus, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and empower us every step of the way. Let me ask you a question, a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer, but if I were to ask you the question, who has primary responsibility for your spiritual growth? What would you say? I think my guess is for many of you say, well, it's I do. But I would say this, no. The answer is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who called you. He's the one that brought you to life. He's the one that has a vision. He was working on you long before you realized it. Our responsibility is secondary responsibility. Our responsibility is to listen and follow. So let me use a different analogy. He is, the, he is the architect of your spiritual life. You are the general contractor. Okay? Now that takes a huge responsibility. We start, okay, then I'm gonna trust the Holy Spirit to lead me. All right? And it takes the responsibility off of us for knowing what to do and puts it where it needs to be on the Holy Spirit. Remember, what we've learned that the Holy Spirit is closer to us than the air we breathe. In fact, remember what Jesus said, 
in the, uh, John 14 when he was leaving, he said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's how you know. And he said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you what? Another helper. And remember that word for helper is that Greek word parakletos, one called alongside, and it's really hard to translate, remember? So that's why different versions will say advocate, helper, comforter, diff- they'll use different words. But he's, what he's saying is that I'm leaving, but later on this passage he says, but I will not leave you as orphans. He said, I'll send another parakletos. And catch this, the key word is not parakletos, the key word is another. Because what he's saying is, I was your first leader. I was your guide. I was your trainer. I was your teacher. I was your rabbi. But I'm leaving now, and I'm sending another to take my place. And so what I want you to catch is when you begin to seek the Lord to create this keystone habit in your life, you're not on your own. The Holy Spirit is there. And you need to enlist his help. In fact, with the rest of these questions, I'll often refer to the Holy Spirit. We need to enlist his help. Lord, will you come and help me? Okay, so that's the first two. Start with the why, that's motivation. Re- recruit the trainer, We're gonna, that's the one that's gonna lead us through the process. But now we, start to need, we, we need to start getting super practical, right? How are we actually gonna design this plan? So number three is identify your best time. So the, next, the first question here, when we start getting practical, is like, when's the best time for you to meet with God? And this is really gonna vary. For example, it's gonna vary based on our personality. For example, uh, I won't have you show of hands, but some of you are morning people, right? Like you, when you wake up, you're up. I'm very much that way. Like the moment I wake up, I'm in overdrive. Like I'm deep within my brain and my most creative thinking, man, I'm ready to go. I hit the shower and just, whoo, my mind's going, you know? I mean, it's so bad, I, can't, I, I have this thing, I have to like feel my hair to see if I washed it. Does it squeak or not, right? Because if, if I wash it, it squeak, but I, I lose all track of what's going on. I just have, I, my mind is going, right? Uh, my wife, and I said this last night when she was here, <laughs> and our evening went fine. <laughs> so, um, but I've often said about, about Lynn, it doesn't matter when Lynn gets up, she doesn't wake up until 11, right? <laughs> so if she meets with Jesus at six in the morning, she will have no memory of that meeting, right? She is a night person. She wakes up at night. She off, Lynn often stays up till two in the morning routinely. And uh, she does some of her best thinking then. It's like she gets so much done once I'm out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so she loves it. And she's always, even when our kids were young, I mean, they go to bed and she loved this time alone with her and her mind's very awake. And so, so you, we're very different that way. Uh, we're also different in terms of schedules. Like some of you are retired. You have all the time in the world to do with what you want. Uh, some of you work a, an eight to five job. It's very, it's very like eight and five. You're done, right? And it's so your time, you're, you're, and you might even work from home. Others of you work 16 to 20 hours a day and includes a long commute. All this impacts, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit knows all that. He knows all that, right? And so he's gonna take that into consideration. Um, And so so we're all gonna be different. And so here's the rule of thumb. The best time, we all need to find the best time to meet, and here's the best time is when you're at your best. That's the best time. Uh, This last week I had you read this PDF from um, Rick Warren's book on Bible study methods. a great book and great chapter that how to have a quiet time, very practical. That will be supplemental to all I'm saying today. But one of the things that, that Rick puts in there is he says the general rule is this, the best time is when you're at your best. Give God the best time of your day when you're freshest and most alert. Don't try to serve God with your leftover time. And then whatever time you set, and I'm a big believer in this, like set a time, right? Especially when you're getting this habit started. So here's the time I'm gonna meet. 
Uh, be consistent in it. Like, don't bounce around. Later on, it might be different in how it works. But if you're trying to set a habit, be consistent in it. And schedule it in your calendar. Make an appointment with God as you would, you would with anyone else. And that's a great, great advice. Okay, so that's where we begin. And you can ask the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to think through when the best time. Given my kids, given my station of life. You know, because this, we're all different stations of life. It's not just work, but you're single, right? You're married. You're married without kids. You're married with kids. You're married with young kids, well, medium kids, married with older kids, out of the house kids, empty nests. All these things will affect when the things are when it's best. Number four. Number four is super important. Many people will not think of this, will violate this, and it really causes problems. So number four goes like this. Choose what to lose. I'm already hearing the groans. Those are good groans. Those are the, the groan of a ha. The groan of a ha. Mm. So anytime we add a new priority in our life that's gonna require time, we need to ask the question, what am I taking away to make room for that? And this is one of the biggest mistakes. I'm gonna start working out. Great, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna run six days a week. Okay, well, what are you, what are you taking away? Well, what do you mean? Well, last I checked, most of us here don't a lot of, have a lot of extra time in our schedule, right? Most of us here are not waking up in the morning and go, what am I gonna do today? I've got a blank calendar and nothing to do. Oh, I'm so depressed, I need to go to therapy, maybe get some medication. You know, like, that's not what, our, most of us are like running a million miles an hour too fast. And so when we try to add something new to this mix, it's just not gonna work. And so when we, we go to, if we're gonna, add, we're gonna add regular time with God, we need to ask, what are we going to take away? So let me give you a very practical example. This, would have, this comes from what, what would have been my opening story, the one that left. But let's just give you a practical example. Let's say that you get fired up after today in the series and you really wanna pursue God. And so you say, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start spending, I'm gonna get up an hour earlier every day to spend time with God. Now later on, I'll recommend not doing an hour, but just let's say you're fired up, right? And so uh, you're gonna get, so, so you have a pretty big job and you, you, have, you, you currently get up at 5.30 every morning to start your day. And so you say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get up at 4.30 every day to, start, to spend time with God. But you don't think in terms of changing your life, taking anything out of your life, you're just going to get up an hour earlier. Well, chances are you're probably not getting enough sleep as it is. And what's gonna happen when you get up at 4.30? It's gonna feel horrible. <laughs> and you're now gonna associate horrible with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus makes me feel horrible. He came to take away my life. <laughs> to live it at the least. Right? right so, so what's going to happen? Like, you know that feeling when you're trying to wake up and you can't? Or here's a worse one. You're trying to stay awake and you're fighting it. And you're sitting in a chair that's comfortable. And it's all dark. And the house is quiet and you're trying to read the word, and it's not making any sense because you're still waking up. So you think, I'll start, I'll, I'll start trying prayer, and five minutes later, you're asleep, <laughs> right? Like, we've all been there, right? It's like, this comes out of my life, right? This comes out of many different attempts at this in my life. Right? So, so here's the thing, what should we do? Well, we should say, if you want to get up an hour early to spend with God, you need to go to bed an hour earlier. And you say, well, wait a second, that's when I do my gaming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wait a second, that's when I watch the reruns of the Gilmore Girls. <laughs> that's my wife, by the way. Uh, uh, hey, that's when I waste my life on Facebook. Okay, Instagram. Okay, TikTok. All right. Have I offended everyone? All right. Okay. Hey, that's when I work. I mean, I'm restoring this car in the garage. It'd take me six more months if I do that. Exactly. So the question is, would you rather restore your car 
waste your life on social media, watch Gilmore Girls, <laughs> or would you rather spend time with Jesus? Right. See, it really is a priority issue. So when we ask this question, what are we going to take away? Because here's the reality. We all have the same amount of time, don't we? We all have 24 hours, you, me, and the president. You'd be so proud of me if you knew what I'm not saying. All right. I'm mean, moving on. The president that we love and respect and pray for. All right, so, okay. Like, we all have the same amount. Of, so catch this. When we say we don't have enough time, that is usually a cop-out. What it really means is we don't have time for God because we think other things are more important. And if that's the truth, let's just face it and just put it like that and stop, stop playing games with it, right? So when we say we don't have time, that's not the truth then you know what, we all have the same amount of time, and guess what? We all have the time, exact amount of time that we have, that we need to carry out God's assignment in our lives. And so this forces us to really think through our priorities and then make some decisions about what we're going to do. All right, so, so number we need, we need to choose what to lose. There's a great quote there. I, one of my favorite books is a book by Greg McEwen. It's a secular book. It's a beautiful book called Essentialism. And he says, the reality is saying yes to any opportunity by definition requires saying no to several others. Right? Okay, number five. Number five is decide where to meet. So this may seem rather mundane, but this is actually important. You know, we meet with anyone, environment matters, doesn't it? Like if you're having a board meeting, a, a business meeting of your board, you're probably not gonna do it at the beach in the sand, right? Everyone get, pulls their laptops out in the sand, you know, sitting in beach chairs with an umbrella. And it says like, no, that's not gonna work. And, and on the flip side, if you're, if you're developing a new friendship with someone, you're probably not gonna invite them to your corporate boardroom, right? That, that envi we're embodied creatures and our environment matters. And so, so you don't wanna be, you wanna give someone, wait, hey, where would be the best place to meet? So let me give you three practical marks of, of where to meet, right? Number one, it should be comfortable. Pick a place that's comfortable. Um, not too comfortable, <laughs> but comfortable. Uh, number two, that's practical. Like, what do you plan to do in your time with God? We'll talk about that later. But hey, if you're a laptop person, you're going to be on your laptop. Is it a, you know, you need a table? Uh, if you're going to be writing, do you, you, do you have some kind of table to write on? Um, you know, it's just what, what, like, what, what are you practically going to need? Uh, and then the third one is peaceful. And peaceful, it will be defined. Uh, it, different people will define that differently, but what I'm really saying is, is a place without distractions, right? A place that, that you're gonna be able to concentrate, and that will, of course, vary from person to person. And so this is gonna vary over times in your life and seasons in your life. I was thinking about this yesterday, and I was thinking about 40 years ago, right? So I know it's a long time, but you know, like 40 years ago, we had just bought our first house, and uh, we were, it was on a third of, third of an acre down in Vista, and, uh, and so it was the first time in my life I had a den, and it was great. You know, so I was able to put a desk, put my computer in there. You remember computers were like huge back then. <laughs> you know, uh, say computer uh, for that, I, I had a, a, a chair, had my books and all, it was great. I, if I just wanted to be talking with the Lord, I could be in an easy chair, if I needed to type something or whatever, I could go to the desk. And it was, you know, very, it was very peaceful, isolated, it was great, so that was great. But here's, but in that same property, because it was a third of an acre and we were on the side of a hill, there was a beautiful gazebo on our property. And I love going up there at times in good weather, just taking up a beach chair and just kind of spending time with the Lord in the gazebo. So kind of look out, beautiful. Um, and then uh, because it was a third of an acre, there'd be certain days that I would do a prayer walk around our yard. We had an Australian shepherd and he would kind of shepherd me around the yard as I did my <laughs> prayer walk. And, then, and, and so it was great. You know, I had these different environments right in my own home. 
Uh, in our area, there was some open, uh, some, a lot of big acreage. I'm not sure who owned it, but they never arrested me. And so uh, I would go on long walks out in nature, the beautiful wildflowers, and there would be this kind of some water uh, ponds out there and stuff like that. And so, and so different eras, different seasons, different ways. Um, when we moved up here to Simi Valley, uh, I, started, uh, I, I, I started the kitchen table. There was times I'd go out to our patio. We'd have a, like a teak uh, table out there and under an umbrella. That was great. There was times I'd be in the living room. There'd be times I'd be in the family room. The different seasons, right? You kind of different seasons. And a lot of you know, that, and I share this on purpose for a reason, that for many years now that my primary place is at Starbucks. And it's interesting because we had a friend, you know, recently was talking to my wife and she, she ha- happened to have a meeting there and she was saying like, how does he concentrate here? So loud, it's so crazy, there's so much going on. But remember how I'm wired, right? That when I get up in the morning, I go deep within, it's just natural for me. And so I can be there, I don't hear, I'm just really focused in. In fact, it was funny because a couple weeks I was there ago, there, and I was you know, working at my, I've got two, small, uh, two oval tables, little round oval tables here that kind of lets people know, don't come that closer. <laughs> and and uh, a woman walks in and I see her in the corner of my eye, she sits over here, you know, like an appropriate spot. And, uh, and so after like 45 minutes, she says, hey, Michael, you know who it was? It was Megan Kareas, like Dre, Pastor Dre's wife. <laughs> I mean, 45 minutes, I hadn't really noticed her. You know, I'm just like in my thing. And what happens when I'm there over a long period of time, I begin to be more aware of my environment or sometimes you have people that are not socially aware and they sit too close, they don't realize. I've got my office going here. I, <laughs> And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so <laughs> I'm prepared for this. I take out my noise canceling headphones and I say goodbye. And we're like, I'm off with Jesus again, right? So the point is, is that for many of you, that would be a nightmare place. You'd be constantly, for me, it's ideal. I've got constant hot coffee, right? Constant. In fact, the baristas, I know them all by name, we're all friends and they see me coming, they just go and fix it for me, they don't even tell me, so I'll break. it's just the greatest arrangement. I got a bathroom right there, two tables, I mean, everything I need. It's just like perfect, right? The point is, you need to find your place, right? I love what Peter Wagner says, I'll be quoting him in a couple of days, but he wrote a great little book called Warfare Prayer, it's about spiritual warfare through prayer. But he said, to find a comfortable, peaceful place is your habitual place of prayer, having a, a familiar, uh, a pleasant and familiar environment. And this is what I'd say is that having a, here's the thing, when you start meeting with God, that place becomes holy ground because it's where he meets you. And so uh, that's why I, I don't bounce around every day or something. I'm starting at different seasons because you kind of get in a groove and that it just makes it easier having a consistent place. So having a pleasant and familiar environment will bring you more quickly and naturally into an attitude of prayer to help you relax. Take a cup of coffee or a glass of juice with you. There's nothing wrong with feeling good while you're praying. And I'd say amen. Okay, number six. Number six is discern what to do. It's like if you're starting to work out and you've never been to a gym before and you just, I'm gonna go to Gold's Gym or I'm gonna go to uh, you know, 24 Hour Fitness or whatever it's called now, whatever, uh, that you walk in, it's overwhelming, right? It's like all these machines you've never seen before um, and you're, you're probably not gonna get anything done. You're just gonna go from machine to machine trying to look like you're not new. <laughs> kind of fake it, like, oh yeah, good machine, that's good. And, uh, <laughs> And, right, and it can, the same thing can happen spiritually. You show up, you don't have a plan. You, know, you don't know what you're gonna do. And so you start reading. You're just like, oh God, just Holy Spirit, lead me. You open your Bible, right? It's Leviticus 16. It's like, ah, uh, not really getting that. Uh, okay, let's try this again, flipping it open. So, and so then we waste time. So, well, I'll start praying. We don't know how to pray. We'll start, well, why don't I pray this thing? I don't know, journal. I'm journal. Anyway, so the point is have a plan. Now, here's what you'll find that if you were to talk to a wide variety of spiritual Christian leaders who have great times with God, you're gonna find that they're really gonna vary in terms of how they approach prayer, how they approach the word. It's gonna be a lot of variety, but there can be certain common ingredients. And I wanna give you three of the most important common ingredients uh, on a normal basis for you to incorporate in your time with God. The first bullet there is the, is the, the ingredient of prayer. 
So prayer is just talking with God, right? Um, one of my favorite quotes on prayer from a billion years ago is uh, like a 17th century writer. His name was William Law. It's not in your note sheet. But um, it, he said, prayer is desire of the heart <coughs> turned towards God. I love that. Prayer is desire of the heart. So prayer is where we just talk with God. Remember, the spending time with God is not something we're checking off our to-do list. It's not like, oh, this is just good for me. We're pursuing God. And so, of course, at the heart of that is conversation. <coughs> we're, we're, we're talking with God. We're listening for his voice, however he's speaking, his word, spirit, and so on. And so, so prayer is where we pursue God in relationship, conversation. But catch this, prayer is also where we partner with God to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. So prayer is, is pursuing relationship. It's partnering for the kingdom. Um, you know, we're, right after Easter, we're going to be having this three-week mini-series. I'll talk about that later. And then after that, we're doing a two-week series on prayer um, that's called uh, Pursuing God, the Priority of Prayer. I'll be bringing two messages, and they're going to bookend our next encounter. So the next encounter is the first week of May. Um, and we're probably going to do it on two different nights because we're too big to do it at one night. We'll do the same thing, like two services here, you know, like three services. Um, and we'll have more information, but it's going to be focused on prayer. And my sense is that, that as the Lord has been creating in us as a church this culture of worship, that sort of the next thing is to create a culture of prayer. And so we're going to, that whole week, we're going to be having encounters, going to focus on pursuing God in prayer. We'll have worship in prayer. Uh, probably every day that we'll have some prayer activities that'll be going on. It happens to be the National Day of Prayer that week. That'll be incorporated into it. Um, and we'll, have, we'll, we'll start with uh, a service on prayer, a weekend on, about um, the first week of the series on prayer, and we'll book it at the end. So it's going to be a real focus on prayer. So we'll give you more on prayer uh, as we're coming, but this prayer as partnership is really important. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 7, he talked about this a lot, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, and as you listen and follow what I'm telling you, and what it, you can ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So, so prayer is going gonna, is gonna to be you know, just talking with God, listening to God, big part of our time with him. Number two, the second, the second key ingredient is word. That we're talking about the word of God here. So what we've learned in this series, the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. It's through his word, the Holy Spirit shapes us, enlightens us, reveals truth, shows us the path to life, right? It's, it's the way he communicates directly to us by highlighting passages of truth for us, so he's speaking directly to us. And so obviously the word is gonna play a huge part in our time with him. We're gonna read it, we're gonna study it, we're gonna memorize it, we're gonna reflect on it. In John chapter eight, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, and in the Greek, the word for teaching is word, okay? If you hold to my word, you're really my disciples. That's how you know whether you're a wannabe or really, whether you listen and follow what I say. He says, and then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So he says, my word has the capacity to change your life and set you free. You kind of listen to it, follow it, and then as you do, truth will be revealed, and as truth is revealed, truth will set you free. So, there, of course, there's many ways to read the word, right? You can read it, you know, pick the book of John, or you pick the book of, you just read a chapter a day. Uh, you can go through, read the, the Bible in a year. Uh, if you go onto the, the, there's this great little app, most of you know, called YouVersion, and version has tons of translations free, uh, the Bible, and it's also got great reading plans, everything from, from uh, kind of how many plans, different plans of reading through the Bible in a year, but also like a lot of great topical, to I mean, you read those, there's a million ways to do this, but we want to invest time in the Word. And then number three, the third category is journaling. Third ingredient is journaling. Now, when I mention journaling, uh, my hunch is some of you absolutely love it, and, um, and then there's others of you that absolutely hate it. And believe it or not, I'd be towards the hate it side. Um, it's boring to me. It's funny, I was talking with Ray backstage, and uh, he was saying, he's like, I'm surprised that, you know, the, you, I thought you loved journaling. You know, he's saying, oh, I, I said, no, no, I actually, I do it 
as a discipline because I need to do it. But I don't like doing it. And he was saying, well, I love it. And it's like, that's great. More power to you. Okay? Okay. Um, but but so, so some people love journaling. Um, well, they want to, they, they're going to write, even write their prayers. And this is very powerful. And often they'll just spend time with the Lord. Is there anything you want to say to me? And just jot down thoughts are coming. It might be from the Lord. And they, they want to, you know, just kind of process out their life. And that's awesome. Um, uh, others of us will be more like this. I, I tend to journal only in two or three situations, but two that come to mind. Uh, number one, whenever the Holy Spirit sees me, shows me an important truth, I want to capture that. Right? And the second time I journal is when I'm processing something that's deep and important. I could be facing a big challenge here at church, could be facing an issue in my family, I could be uh, uh, facing an issue in my own life. And one of my rules, I wanna be as radically honest with God as I can. I wanna get every thought, every emotion down on paper, write it out to help me get in touch with what's going on so I can take it to the Lord and say, okay, now I need your wisdom on this, you see? So for me, I can, I can journal twice a month, uh, I can journal uh, three times a week. It just depends. Um, and I never like to do it. Now, when you journal, you can do it kind of, uh, you can do it hard copy. A lot of people love that. It's just write with your hand. I have the worst writing in the world, and it looks horrible. It's hard to read, and it cramps my hands after. It's funny, like when I, you, <laughs> this is nothing about, and has nothing to do with anything, but like when I'm signing baptismal certificates, like they'll bring me 35. You know, to, I literally have to do them throughout the whole day, five at a time. Because after five, my hand's going crazy. Right? So I type, I use a digital, pro, I use Evernote. I keep all my journaling in Evernote. I can read it, I can access it all the time. When Lynn has a word for me, I scan it into Evernote, I tag it, Lynn's prophecies, uh, the year. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, so for me, I'll go digital, you may like analog. Either way works. Just find what works, okay? I love the quote there from Mark Batterson. Mark Batterson wrote a great book called this, uh, the, 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 uh, the Circle Maker. It's all about prayer. If you want to grow in prayer, Mark's book is a great place to read. Um, but he says, in my opinion, journaling is one of the most overlooked and underappreciated spiritual disciplines or practices. Journaling is the difference between learning and remembering. It's also the difference between forgetting and fulfilling our goals, okay? And so, so these are the big three. And so I would say, um, I would say that, that kind of most of our time with God, we're gonna spend time in his work, some time in prayer, uh, often gonna include journaling, depending on your preference. But what, what I want you to catch, these are the big three, but not the only three. Because what you're gonna find is as the Holy Spirit shepherds you, you're gonna find other ways that you connect. Remember, the whole goal of this is to connect with God in a way that refreshes and renews your soul, that enlightens your mind, that transforms your life, or you can, that's just why we're doing this. We're not going through the motion, we're pursuing God. So find out what works for you. So for example, uh, worship is one. Um, for some of you, like spending time just worshiping while you put on a, a, a like your Spotify or whatever, and you kind of worship, that'd, that'd be very meaningful. It's interesting, well, remember I talked different seasons. Back in 2003, remember in 2003, in the fall of 2003, God began to do something new in my life, completely uh, unforeseen for no apparent reason. He just is very creative. And, um, and so up to that point, I love corporate worship. I always love corporate worship, being together with you, worshiping. I love that. But I've never been one to worship in my one-on-one -on -one time with God. And uh, I could not tell you any songwriters. This was back in a day when it was before MP3s. So we had CDs. Remember those discs, right? Someone this week gave me a CD of music. I'm like, how do I play this thing? I don't know. It's like, you know. I don't know anything that runs that, but it was during, so over that fall, God just ignited this passion for worship. And I bought 20 CDs, I could not get enough, and I would spend sometimes hours at a time with the Lord worshiping, and catch this, I no longer do that. I, it's not part of my life now, but it was then. It was that season. And so for some of you, it might be worship. Uh, for some of you, it might be other, you know, other, like silence. For some people, 
People, a lot of people find that when they're just silent before the Lord that God really speaks. You know what happens when I'm silent before the Lord? I get really bored. The beautiful thing, God works with different people in different ways. Uh, there's ancient ways of studying the word and meditating the word. There's a thing that called Lectio Divina that's kind of resurfing, kind of popular right now. It doesn't work for me very much, but it works for others really well. So the point is, like, like let the Holy Spirit guide you, experiment. Uh, Mark again, Mark Batterson again says, it takes time to discover, and I want you to underline that, because this is gonna come up on our seventh point. It takes time to discover, we're still on six, don't get confused. The last quote there on six, it takes time to discover, that's what I want you to underline, the rhythms and routines that work for you. This will take time. What works for others might not work for you, and what works for you might not work for others. I've always subscribed to the sentiment shared by Oswald Chambers, one of my great leaders, spiritual leaders. Let God be as original with other people as he is with you. Isn't that beautiful? All right, number seven. Number seven, start slowly and expect opposition. So let's start with starting slowly. This is like, uh, I'm gonna give you like two sides of a coin here with start slowly. So there's kind of two aspects. When I say start slowly in two different ways. First of all, I'm talking just about time. You know, many times what happens, we get fired up after a message or a series like that. We wanna meet with God. And so we, we, we say, I'm gonna start off, you know, I'm gonna set an hour, aside, an hour uh, to be with the Lord every day or something. And that's great. If the Lord leads you that way, the Holy, like, great, go for it. But for most people, that's a mistake. And the reason is, it's way too much too fast. And so it's just too hard. So let, let me give you an analogy. Let's say that instead of trying to create the keystone habit of spending time with God, that the goal here, I was all talking to you, I was coaching you on how to run a marathon. And so we're all different levels of shape. And but let's just say you're, you're out of shape, you have no experience running. Like, it would be a real mistake to say, hey, 26 miles is a long time, a long, a long, long distance. I'm gonna start by tomorrow morning, I'm gonna run 10, okay? <laughs> That's a huge mistake, right? Because it's gonna be very painful. It's gonna take you like eight years. <laughs> by the end, you're gonna be having blisters. Tomorrow when you wake up, the next day, you're gonna be not able to move. And you're gonna decide, this was a really bad idea. I can't, I'm not a marathon runner. Like if you, if you came to me and said, I wanna run a marathon, I would say, okay, uh, and you're out of shape, I'd say, okay, well, let's try this. Let's start by walking around the block. See if you don't die. All right? <laughs> and if you don't die in a week, let's do two times around the block. All right? And we would, we would do, we would do walking, and once walking was, you're, you're walking a few miles, I, we'd switch to jogging, and we'd go back to jogging around the block, right? We'd do jogging, we'd build up, and then over time, we would start to lengthen that out, and you'd have a regular way, and you'd, you'd be able to run a marathon, right? It's the same way spiritually. Remember, our goal here is not to be super keystone habit people in two weeks. Our goal here is that this, this time, this will be a new habit that carries you the rest of your life. And so we don't have to get there overnight. We just wanna start slowly and start building the habit. It will take care of itself. So you say, well, where, where would you start? You know, just, you ask the Holy Spirit for you, but just kind of a general wisdom, where would you start? I would say start with 15 minutes at least five times a week. Pick the day, at least 15 minutes. You say, why 15? Because 15 is long enough to get something done. But short enough, it doesn't require that big a change in your life. So in 15, like, and that's actually, it may seem long, but you know, if you do these three activities, you open up and you just talk with Jesus and ask him to be with you and ask the Holy Spirit. And then maybe you read a chapter. You just pick a, I'm gonna read, you know, I'm gonna read a gospel. I'm gonna start with the gospel. I'm just gonna read for five minutes. Just read a chapter. Just gonna ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything here for me? Maybe you jot down a couple notes, a couple things you learn. 
And then you just, you just wrap up by talking about your day, asking God for your day, whatever's worrying you. You just kind of talk about that with God. You maybe ask some things for your family, for your church. Just start like that. I'm telling you, 15 minutes is going to go like that. You'll probably need more. And if you want to go longer, that's fine. But you're only committing to 15. And it's very doable. And what you'll find is this will become something over time you'll start to look forward to. And what 15 will turn into 20 and turn into 30 and the Holy Spirit will, will shepherd you. Um, there in your, uh, in your uh, note sheet, again, another quote from Peter Wagner. I agree that a reasonable long-range goal for daily prayer time is an hour. I also understand that for many, this will be a lifelong goal that may never be reached on a regular basis. But if you're starting from scratch, use short-term goals and plan to increase your time gradually. If this sounds quite demanding, try starting five minutes. To me, that's like, oh, okay. Um, then increase it to 10. In my opinion, five minutes every day is much more valuable than 15 minutes every three days, even though I'd consider e- either queer- clearly inadequate for strategic level spiritual warfare. But, but the point is, you know, just start small, right? But remember I said that starting slowly has two sides. So here's the other side of starting slowly. What I mean by that is lower your expectations. I think whenever we start to pursue God, we have huge expectations. This is going to change my life. I'm going to get so close to God. I want to hear his voice. And we're a couple weeks into it, and we're just kind of struggling in the rhythm. And a lot of days aren't meaning much to us. We're not getting anything out of it. Prayer is a little hard. And we get discouraged because we, we started with these expectations. But really, that would be like being completely out of shape, needing to lose 60 pounds, and you go to the gym for two weeks, and you're like, hey, this is not working. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, it's going to take time. You haven't even learned the machines yet, right? Like, you still haven't figured out how to even do that exercise. You, you're still working on your routine. And here's the thing. When we, when we start a new rhythm in any area, we're going we're gonna to learn an instrument. We're going to play a sport. We're going to learn a new position at work. At the beginning, you're so focused on just learning the keys you're not enjoying playing the music. It's gonna take a while. You're so focused on just dribbling the ball. It's not that much fun, right? But if this is what happens, is it, but over time, these rhythms begin to come into play. And you'll see the difference. So just lower your expectations. If you say, well, I tried it and I didn't get anything out of it. That's okay. That's okay, you're right where you're supposed to be. Right? You're right where you're supposed to be. The second part of this principle, though, is to expect opposition. And this is so important because I want you to, I want you to catch, you know, one of the things I'm increasingly aware of in this last year is the reality of the unseen realm. I'm telling you, I am so much more aware than I was even a year ago of the reality of the unseen realm. You know, this morning we're singing that song, uh, the, you know, Jesus, the name above your name or the name above all names above all powers and stuff. Can I tell you, like last night, we were, I was in the worship, nine o'clock I was in worship, you know, between, I'm never in worship at 11 because I'm just resting and get ready for you all. Um, but I'm always here at like at 5.30 and I, I love this time of worship and I'm telling you, as I'm, I'm singing that song about Jesus and his name, I am so moved because you know what I've seen the last year? I've seen the power of the name of Jesus in ways I never have. I've seen confrontations with demonic strongholds and I've watched them flee at the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you, the power of his name, it is powerful. And men and women, we are in a spiritual battle. It's very real. You have an enemy who's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy your marriage. He's trying to destroy your family. He's trying to ruin you through anxiety and depression. He's all over you. And you know what? He's been studying the human race since day one. And he's very smart. And you know what? He knows the power of this keystone habit better than you and better than me. And he understands how dangerous you can become as a warrior for the kingdom. He gets it. And so guess what? He's going to do everything he can to keep you from these three things. Keep you from church. Keep you from your small group. 
to keep you from spending time with Jesus because he knows the power that's unleashed when we seek him with the whole heart. So when you start, you say, I'm gonna make a key. Do you think he's gonna try to stop that? Absolutely. You're getting nothing out of it. What a waste of time. You're not like other people. God's not gonna speak to you. You're too sleepy in the day. You're not gonna perform. You've been cranky. Yeah, like he, and it's not just on the outside, it's inside, it's to the outside. Your child who's always slept through the night, suddenly waking up, right? It's like things are breaking. There's conflict in your marriage for no reason. Look what, uh, look what John Eldridge writes in Wild at Heart. He said, most of all, the enemy will try to jam communications with headquarters. <laughs> Commit yourself to prayer every morning for two weeks and just watch what happens. You won't want to get up. An unimportant meeting will be called that interferes. You'll catch a cold. Or if you do get to your prayers, your mind will wander to what you'll have for breakfast and how much you should pay for the water heater repair and what color socks would look best for the gray suit. Many, many times I've simply come under a cloak of confusion so thick I suddenly find myself wondering why I ever believed in Jesus in the first place. Whoa, he's right on the money. All right. So seven key steps. Now, as we wrap up this series, I want to wrap up this series with one final question. And there on your note sheet, you have a section called Hearing God, One Final Question. And I, before I ans- ask the question, I want to set this up. So for 10 weeks, we've invested our lives in this issue of hearing God. The first three weeks, we, we said, what kind of person do we need to become to be kind of the person that God can trust and speak to. And we learn that, that God is looking for people that pursue him with a whole heart, who love him with all their heart, mind, and soul. People that want to know him and to love him and to please him as their top priority. A people that are absolutely surrendered. Remember week three, that spontaneous altar? Absolutely, that we want to do your will, whether it's go to the right or to the left. And then we spent three weeks talking about how God speaks to us, the wide variety of ways that God speaks. And then we spend two weeks, and how do we discern when it's God, when it's me, or when it's the enemy? And these last two weeks, we've turned the corner, and we said, how do we pursue God in large groups, small groups, one-on-one? How do we pursue him and create this keystone habit of spending time with God so we become that kind of person, and we create space in our lives? And so now as we come to the end of this series, I've got one final question for you. And it goes like this. What will you do with what you know? What will you do with what you know? Now that you've heard this, I mean, I have done my best. Joel has done his best. Dre has done, we've done our best to say, hey, from years of walking with Jesus, this is the best we can know and can tell you of here's how to walk with God. Here's how to hear his voice, how to discern it. Here's how to listen. Here's how to follow. And the question is now that you've heard, what will you do with what you know? Because the reality is we can walk out of here and say that was an amazing series, talk with our spouse, talk with our friends, talk with our life group. Wasn't that great? But the reality is if we don't act on what we've learned, that a year from now, we will be no different. Or perhaps even worse. So how hungry are you to pursue God? What will you do with what you know? You know, I want to end with a couple quotes. One is not on your note sheet, the first one. It comes from yesterday I was spending time with God and I was reading one of the spiritual classics called The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And he said something that just, that just spoke so powerfully in terms of this final message. And so it's not on your note sheet, but it's going to come on the screen. This is what he says. He says, complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire, and by that he doesn't mean acute desire, you know, (laughs) like intense desire, right? Intense desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. Remember we learned, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Remember Jesus said, those who obey me, I will send the Holy Spirit, right? 
And he said, he, talking about Christ, Christ waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long, in vain. The second quote is, comes from John Piper, famous pastor in our country. He wrote the great book, Desiring God. And he says there in your notes, I'm constantly astonished at people who say they believe in God, but they live as though happiness were to be found by giving him 2% of their time, their attention. Surely the end of the ages will reveal this to be what? Absurd. You know what he's saying? At the end of our life, we're going to be there with Jesus. I think of 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We'll all stand before him to receive what we've, what, we've, uh, what we've earned, our wages in the Greek, whether for good or evil. And we're, you know, we're going to be there. We're going to know each other. You're going to know me. I'm going to know you. We're going to remember this series. And our lives are going to be evaluated, and they're going to be evaluated, and they're either going to be said, well done, good and faithful servant, or, or absurd. <laughs> Do we want to be on the right side of history in the deepest sense of reality, <laughs> right? Like, what do you want? Do you want your life to count, or do you want it to be absurd? Do you want to make a difference, or do you want to waste your life? What will we do with what we know? Amen? Let's pray. So, Lord, we've we just come to the end of this series, and it's been powerful. Lord, you met us every week. You've opened our eyes. We've learned so much, and we're hungry for you. And, God, as we come to the end of this series, and as we come this morning to the communion table, we come to your body, we come to your blood, we come to the reminder of the price you paid to have relationship with us. We come to the one who's chosen us before time. We come to the one who died for us in time. We come to the one who's resurrected, reigning over all time. And we come to you in this table, Lord. And what a beautiful opportunity is for each of us to evaluate our lives and ask us the question, what will we do with what we know. As we come, Lord, I'm sure that for many that you'll just be saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You're on the right path. For others, we've been far distant land. We've been living in sin and rebellion. Today's the day we come home and say, I'm done with that. Like the prodigal, I'm coming home. And Father, I know you'll run to them to welcome them. For others of us, we've just been complacent. It's not like we're off in some major sin or rebellion, but we're just, it's like we just don't care. We just we just have the sickness of apathy in our life. And we need the fresh wind of your spirit to blow. And so we pray as we come to the the communion table to receive your gift of, of forgiveness, a gift of new life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood as my life. God, we pray that you meet us in a powerful way according to our need in Jesus' name, amen.